Thanks everyone for joining me today. Um, the uh, report we're going to be going over today is our recently published study on the OEM genuine oil brands and programs in the consumer um, automotive segment, uh, specifically around PCMO that, that happens uh, or sales through the OEM franchise workshop channel. Now, um, <clears throat> this study, we wanted to do a couple things. This is the second edition of the study. And uh, when we first launched, we were basically covering uh, mainly the genuine oils and the OEMs that provide genuine oils. Uh, for this edition of the study, we were looking to provide a bigger picture of the entire franchise workshop channel. So this includes all the OEMs that don't have genuine oils that use co-branded or merchant branded. And we basically wanted to see how big uh, the segment is also kind of figure out ways to segment this channel. So we segment it by, you know, uh, OEM types, dealer sizes, locations, etc. Uh, and we also covered eight countries um, individually in depth. So we have sort of a global roll up of trends and things we see for the OEMs. Um, a lot of OEMs are, are basically global. So um, you see some common practices from the different countries, but you also see some individuality in each of the countries where, you know, certain countries, depending on the culture and, and you know, the, whether or not the OEM is a domestic OEM for that country, you'll see some differences in the way they behave. So that's why we kind of did a deep dive into eight individual markets. Now, um, the, the main goal for us, so we want to see how big of a share uh, OEM franchise workshops are in uh, the overall PCMO market. Now, the overall PCMO market was around 7 million tons pre-COVID. So in 19, um, or 2019, I should say, it was around 7 million tons. However, um, the global pandemic and the ensuing shutdowns and kind of recession uh, caused 2020, obviously, to be a down year. And we estimate that to be down around 18%. But even with that, um, the OEM franchise workshop channel, we estimate to be uh, almost a quarter of that whole market. So as far as PCMO sold, almost a quarter of it goes through the uh, dealership uh, service bays um, and basically service um, from, uh, you know, from an OEM authorized or franchised workshop. Um, now, the interesting thing too, is when you look going forward, so we did a future uh, view, Kat, um, for projection. And we do see PCMO recovering a fair bit. It's, it won't go past uh, 2019, but it was kind of on the decline anyway. And you have the you know EV slowly continuing to creep in to the overall car park. So um, you know we're gonna see a, some, a significant recovery, but um, what we've seen is that the growth of PCMO and the OEM franchise workshop channel roughly <clears throat> double uh, the growth or recovery rate of overall PCMO. So why is this channel, um, you know, growing? And that's one of the things we wanted to study is, is what was uh, driving this growth. And some of the topics we're going to cover as far as what drives this growth is, you know, obviously new, new passenger vehicle sales will drive it. Um, we're also seeing OEMs and their dealerships allocating a lot more of their marketing and, and budgeting to growing the after sales service side of the business or you know in the US we call it fixed operations. Um, but uh, the other thing is there's a lot more vested in, in trying to get the customers to come back to their dealers. And so we'll see what um, these OEMs and, and the businesses are doing, but there's also a bit of a, a cultural drive to bring people back as well. Now, as I had mentioned, the biggest driver of, you know, after sales service through the OEM channel is new vehicles. And basically uh, the majority of their customers are owners of vehicles that are still under the OEM warranty. Uh, it makes sense because you wanna protect the warranty. You're gonna to try to take it back to the dealer. This way there's no questions of whether or not you missed a service or anything, should anything break. And so, you know, people are more inclined to do that. Um, if you look, uh, you know, the pie chart's pretty simple. In 2020 vehicle sales, the leaders are VW and Toyota. And so, you know, OEMs, you would think they're in the market to sell vehicles, new vehicles. So what is, you know, why are they concerning themselves with trying to grow their, their after sales service for their dealers? Well, for one, 
um, they're looking to boost their profitability a bit. Um, you know, the OEMs, vehicle OEMs don't really make a terribly huge uh, net profit on their vehicles. I mean, they're, they're multi-billion dollar businesses, but out of that, there's a lot of expenses. There's a lot, you know, uh, that goes into it. So they really, you know, profit margins, like if you take VW, for instance, in 2020, their, their prop, net profit margin was around 3.7%, right? That's not a whole heck of a lot. Um, and then if you consider in 2019, which was actually an, an up year in vehicle sales, it was under 2%. And so really, it's, it's hard for these OEMs to try and grow their, their margins for their shareholders and, and, you know, maintain their stock. And that's um, why they're looking into kind of the after sales uh, service side to kind of boost some of their profitability. But the other thing too is um, they're trying to maintain their margins on new vehicles, which means their dealerships that work for them are not making as much money on new cars or technically they're, they're making similar profits as they were uh, on vehicles sold five, 10 years ago. But the problem is the, the MSRP on these new vehicles can be up to you know two times uh, the MSRP of those vehicles they sold five or 10 years ago. So off a uh, you know, $15,000 car, maybe they made 500 or $1,000. Um, but now off of a 30 or $40,000 car, they're still making 500 bucks. And so the problem is the dealers themselves are not that profitable anymore, especially on new car sales. And because of that, you know, the OEMs need to keep their dealers, you know, in business. Obviously, if they're not making money, they'll go out of business. And the less dealerships and the smaller your network is, the, the less your new vehicle sales are. So that's the other reason is they're looking to use this as a better way to let their dealers stay profitable and at the same time, kind of grow their profit margin a bit and maintain their new vehicle margins. So this is kind of why they've, they've been investing a fair bit in this. I mean, they have dedicated uh, departments, marketing departments and, and uh, to growing specifically the, the after sales service side of their dealerships. Um, and the OEMs have done things like, um, you know, they, they run marketing campaigns. So like Ford used to advertise uh, the Ford Works package, which is like a, an oil change, tire rotation, and vehicle inspection. Um, they'd advertise that at, at fairly competitive rates with local um, quick lubes and things. So, and this is done on behalf of their dealerships. It's, it's you, know, you know, they'll advertise it in, say, New Jersey, for instance, and they'll broadcast it over a certain area over the radio or, you know, send out uh, ad, ad, advertising pamphlets and things. Um, and then basically the dealerships get, you know, free advertising. They don't have to lay out any additional money on their side. Um, but then the dealerships themselves, they're also doing more advertising. They're, they're trying to stay as competitive as they can. Um, often these dealers, you know, an oil change at a dealership, especially for the basic, uh, you know, conventional or whatever is the minimum sort of oil change. Those are quite competitive with, uh, you know, your typical quick lubes. The other things we've seen OEMs doing lately is, uh, you know, they've been investing in other kinds of programs, alternative ways to, to retain their customers. And we've seen some major OEMs basically, you know, they'll, they'll get uh, uh, basically put a lot of thought and effort into their customer loyalty program, so much so that they'd actually consult like a JetBlue or, you know, some of the other major um, businesses, I, I believe they consulted like a Marriott as well. And so people, uh, businesses are areas that have typically focused on customer rewards and customer loyalty programs. Um, you know, these OEMs are basically really trying to put forth uh, uh, their best foot forward on their new customer loyalty programs. And they really just want to retain as much of their customer base as they can and also attract some new where they can as well. And so, like I said, OEMs are really trying to, to launch into that. And a lot of the rewards and loyalty programs are focused around service. So you would get like uh, points for buying parts or doing service at the dealership. And then those points can then be applied to buy, you know, if you want a special tire cover for your Jeep or something like that, you can then use the rewards to kind of buy these or get discounts. Now, <clears throat> one of the interesting step outs for OEMs has been uh, their expansion into the basically quick lube or fast fit market. So we're familiar with like the typical service bays at dealerships, you know, they do everything from an engine swap or frame swap to a simple oil changer tire rotation. 
But um, we've also seen for quite a few years now that uh, the, the dealerships have added an actual dedicated quick lube or two bay. And so these are just purely, you know, engine oil changes, maybe an air filter and something simple, uh, but they're, decide, they're, they're set up for a quick in and out. So whereas a typical, you know, you go into a dealership, you wanna get your oil change, it might take up to an hour or more uh, because they have other cars in there that are getting parts fixed, new alternators, new whatever. And so um, it's kind of a mix, but since they've installed these dedicated quick lubes, the quick lube side is, is designed more like the actual quick lubes where it's it's meant to move vehicles through as quickly as possible. So you're getting like almost as quick of a service through these dealerships as you would through, you know, your typical Jiffy Lube or other like, you know, 15 minute oil change kind of um, business, but you're getting them through the, the um, OEMs. And so now what's even more interesting is, you know, you have like Ford with their fast lane there's actually been some step out where they've made dedicated quick loops. So you've actually seen standalone fast lane uh, service. You know, they basically look like a little jiffy lube. They brand them like Ford owns the fast or quick lane, sorry, I should say quick lane brand. Um, and so the OEMs are really trying to branch out and, and make their own quick lubes. Um, and then those quick lubes aren't designed only for Ford vehicles. They're designed actually to handle others. Now, Traditionally, they still tend to focus only on, on the vehicles that uh, they manufacture, but uh, the quick loop is all capable of servicing like a GM or a Honda or some other vehicle, uh, at least for the oil changes. What we've also seen is, so that's, that's more like a, of a US type trend, but we've seen this in Asia as well. So yeah, we've seen uh, some of the Chinese OEMs where they actually own their own sort of uh, fast fit stores. And they, st they started their own kind of step out chains where um, it's, it's sort of their way of expanding their vehicle network much more quickly because you don't have to build, you know, a mega dealer every 10 blocks. So this way you might have one dealership, but then you might have four uh, service centers, you know, uh, within say like 10 miles of these or 20 miles, something of that nature where um, it allows the, uh, their customers that flexibility to find a local service center that is still an OEM, you know, genuine service center. Um, and then these service centers are also designed to handle other kind of quick services. So obviously they're not going to be replacing your engine or swapping a frame or doing any major work, but they can do air filters, they can do small recalls like a PCM flash, things like that. So um, it's kind of a way for the OEMs to expand their network and also make it so that, um, you know, it's more convenient for their customers. Because I recall some of the, the quick lube surveys, one of the, the major reasons um, customers choose certain quick lubes or go to quick lubes versus a dealer uh, isn't necessarily the price, surprisingly. It's actually the convenience and the location. So one tends to be around, you know, within your town, around the corner. The other one tends to be anywhere from like a, you know, 20 minute to 40 minute drive away. So it, it takes time and effort to get to those, whereas it might be only a 10 minute drive to your local quick loop. So let's see. Um, now, as far as the fluids, the, the thing that really kicked off the first iteration of this study was the, the growth we saw in genuine oil brand. Now, uh, as far as the branding of engine oils in the OEM Franchise Workshop channel, these are split kind of into three uh, categories. So you have your genuine fluids. Genuine fluids are basically anything where all you see is the OEM, the OEM branding on the front label. You don't tend to know who makes it unless you flip the bottle over. You might see a small uh, blended by on the bottom of the bottles. Um, then you obviously have your traditional merchant brands and uh, some mix, you know, there's not as prevalent, but you do see some co-branding as well. So, you know, part of the study covers is why do OEMs choose certain things? So just to kind of go high level on this. So as far as genuine oils go, the main reason uh, an OEM chooses genuine oils, it differentiates their channel. So if you have a Toyota Genuine or a VW, you know, long life Genuine, um, the, the uh, service writers can say, you know, we have all genuine parts, genuine fluids. They are designed for your vehicle. They're, you know, the absolute best for maintaining your vehicle. And, and so it gives it some, because generally speaking, 
uh, genuine oils are not typically available outside of that channel. Now it does leak out somewhat through like the gray market. You do see uh, online sales of, you know, some genuine fluids, but th that's mainly a dealership service department kind of trying to, to boost their volumes on, on their genuine fluids. Um, but it's not an actual like OEM sanctioned channel. Now, sometimes uh, the OEMs are actually trying to sanction it and sell it through the, uh, you know, the independent workshop channels and chains. But for the most part, genuine oils are locked in and, and it's a reason for customers to keep coming back because this way they know they're always getting the genuine fluids and parts. Um, now merchant brands, that's a much more simple uh, solution for their dealerships. Now when OEMs in the past, when they didn't care quite as much about service, uh, you know, and depending on the OEMs, some were a lot looser with their dealers. Basically, as long as, you know, the OEM might set a specification. So they might say API SN 0W20 or 5W30, and that's all you have to meet. So any fluid that meets those uh, qualifications you can use to service our vehicles. And so the dealership was free to bid it out. And oftentimes it was like a distributor brand or a private label brand, but sometimes it'd be like a merchant brand, like a Quaker state or something. Um, and, you know, the dealership was free to change whenever they had a salesperson visit the store and say, Hey, listen, I can get you, you know, 520 for X dollars a gallon. It's cheaper than this. And I'll throw in a couple of tanks or whatever it is, but you could sway a dealership to, to switch over to a lubricant, you know, and, and they were mainly concerned on price, but the thing is when there, these dealerships, well, what the OEMs were seeing is when the dealerships had that freedom, sure, it made their cost for lubricants usually a little bit cheaper, a little more flexible, but um, one, the OEM didn't make any margin, you know, on, have anything to do with it. So there was no profit for the OEMs themselves, but there was also uh, no reason for the customers to have to come back to um, the dealership. Like, so if the dealership is 45 minutes away and, and they're using mobile one, for instance, um, you could just go to the local, you know, Exxon quick, quick lube and get your mobile one oil change there. And what's the difference? So um, it, it kind of took away the differentiation. Now, the last one's kind of an in-between. Co-branding has been something we've seen kind of come and go. It depends on the OEMs. Um, and then we kind of get into it in the study. But generally speaking, you'll see co-branding is a way to obviously leverage both brands because both brands are, will be featured on the front label. So, you know, the couple sample products, you have a, a Castrol GTX co-branded, you have a Shell Helix also co-branded right there. And so um, what happens with these co-branding or co-branded products is it's not as easy for the OEM to switch away from their supplier because obviously if they do switch say away from Shell, then the customer will see a change in the product, right? Whereas with the genuine fluids, you, the, the OEM is free to switch their suppliers or use multiple suppliers in different regions, different countries. And the consumer can technically still have the same look and feel. And so when you have co-branding, you're kind of locked in a little bit, almost like merchant, but you still have the exclusivity of this co-branded product is only available through the dealership channel. Now, there is still some leakage where customers go, well, if, I, if it's a Shell Helix provided product for your vehicle, then I can't get that product, but I can get another Shell Helix. And it should be, you know, similar as what a, a customer might think. But the reason why OEMs use this is, especially if the OEM brand reputation might not be so strong, then leveraging with a bigger brand like an ExxonMobil or a Shell, you know, a BP, this, this allows them to kind of leverage a, a big brand. So it kind of builds trust in their service. You say, okay, look, we use, you know, you might not necessarily trust a Hyundai Genuine Fluid, but a, a Shell product you certainly are familiar with. And so you can see that our service dealers, our, our dealer service base use quality products and, you know, the pricing is competitive. So it's a, it's a good reason to get customers to kind of come back. And one thing I've always seen, like, especially when, when doing interviews for these um, studies, we did, we did a ton of interviews with dealerships to see, you know, how they handle the products, what they see going on. And one of the common themes I used to see was that uh, they say the, uh, the sales side, the, the new vehicle sales side might sell the first vehicle, but the service side tends to sell the second and third vehicle. So really getting customers to come back for sale, uh, for the service on their vehicle is quite valuable for the OEM and for the um, dealership because it tends to bring them back. It gets them, you know, familiar with the new cars. You know, they usually walk through, walk around the showrooms while they're uh, waiting for their vehicle to get serviced. 
Um, it also gives the staff uh, more time to build kind of a, a repertoire with the customer and, and build a relationship. So you, you kind of build that customer loyalty. And so um, the service side is quite important for dealerships uh, themselves and for the OEMs. Now, um, as far as the, the study went, we, we tried to segment it. So what we try to do is help like lube marketers, if you're deciding how to get into it, you know, where you want to play or, you know, whether or not it's something you want to get into, if you want to get into the genuine, or if you think you can uh, slot your merchant branded fluids into, into certain dealerships. So what we were asked to do is kind of look to segment this market in as many ways as, as reasonable for each country market. And it varies per country market. So for some countries, you know, dealership size makes a difference. For some uh, markets that are located in say urban versus rural areas, that makes a difference. You know, obviously the brand positioning of the OEM makes a difference. You're gonna have a different uh, customer base for say a, a Daimler Mercedes versus, you know, a VW or a, a domestic branded uh, vehicle. And so, <clears throat> Um, we tried to segment it that way, and we, we certainly saw differences. I'll just give you some examples of what we found in the study was like, uh, we found the, the bigger dealers. So bigger dealers located in urban areas that tend to move more vehicles. Uh, those folks followed the OEM guidelines much more strictly than, say, a smaller dealership in a rural area. And that's because they were more likely to be audited by the OEM. So now if Daimler says in the Mercedes dealer, you have to use the Daimler Genuine, in the urban areas that they tend to follow that very, very strictly. Now, in the rural areas, if there's more profit to be made selling a mobile one versus the Daimler Genuine, then the dealership might actually be more prone to, to selling the merchant branded fluids and using that to service their vehicles because they had a lower chance of audit and their profitability on new cars was certainly going to be less than a volume dealer in, in an urban area. So they're looking for more profitability from their service side. Um, and then one of the other, uh, I mean, it's good and bad. COVID has obviously affected all of us globally in, in many, many different ways. So we were trying to look at uh, how COVID impacted the, the Franchise Workshop channel, right? The OEM FWS channel. And so obviously we had like the short-term impact, you know, you had uh, sales, sales floors were closed in lots of countries. So new vehicle sales stopped, manufacturing stopped for a lot of the OEM. So, you know, it was a huge hit in sales in 2020, um, but that was short-term. It, it comes back once, once uh, everything uh, goes back to normal-ish. Um, but, you know, obviously you had other things like less miles traveled by people, especially in 2020, but that's recovering as well to a certain extent. Um, but we were trying to look at, well, what are the longer term impacts? I mean, if COVID only was around for like say two months or three months, then you know I wouldn't see too many longer term impacts. Most likely people would go back to the ways they were. But I mean, it's been over a year at this point and people are still you know, in second, third, fourth waves of this. We're still in, in you know, some countries are locking down again, not, not as commonly, but the thing is it's been long enough that we feel it's, it's affected consumer behavior to a certain extent. So that's what we tried to find out in the study as well. So what are the OEMs doing differently? What's worked for OEMs uh, that has helped them grow during the, the pandemic, you know, for after sales service versus the ones that have been struggling with it. And so what we found kind of longer term, and, and there's a lot more detail than the study, but, um, what we found, for instance, longer term is that obviously people are shopping more online. There's less person-to-person -person contact. So you're not going to have the same um, uh, opportunities to reach out to your customer uh, physically, you know, face-to-face -face as you used to. So normally, if customer brought their vehicle in for service, you know, they'd wait around in the waiting room, they'd, they'd wander around the showroom, maybe chat with the salesperson if they were bored. And so this is a traditional way. Nowadays, you know, um, if you drop off the vehicle, you might hang out outside in the parking lot or a dedicated waiting area where you're six feet apart. You're not really going to seek out the, uh, the salespeople. You're not going to talk to as many people. And, or there's, you know, obviously there's like services like pick up and drop off. So you may never even have to step foot back in your dealership again. You just pay a little extra and your vehicle gets picked up and then dropped back off with the oil changed and tires rotated and everything kind of done. And so 
you know, how, how we, we've kind of looked into how OEMs are prepping for this, you know, Volvo, for instance, has their Volvo Ballet. They, I forgot what the statistics were exactly, but um, their uh, basically manager for that program was saying that the dealerships that had rolled out Volvo Ballet before the pandemic saw a, a, a double digit uptick in their after sales service um, versus the dealerships that hadn't rolled out this feature where, you know, you could schedule uh, someone to come pick up your vehicle, get it serviced and drop it back off in your driveway or, you know, garage, wherever it's parked. And so, you know, these are the things that we've seen OEMs kind of work on. So um, there's, there's certainly other impacts that we, we've seen, you know, there's, for instance, some shift back to DIY. So that would obviously take away from the channel, but there's, there's a lot more kind of going into building the channel. It, it, it also kind of helps to see, as I said, when we study and what they did differently and how, how that impacted their, their overall uh, projection for growth in nets after sales service on their, on their dealerships. Now, um, thanks for listening to me. And, and as I said, this study, we, we, are just, um, we just published not too uh, long ago. Um, there's a couple of features I guess I wanted to go over. One, we give you the interactive models. So we set up these models so that, you know, we input what we think the customer loyalty rates. Uh, there's the sales figures that we've, you know, purchased from a database. And, and so the sales figures kind of go into there and, and you see how the model plays out how much volume we see each going. So it, it's a interesting aspect where you can kind of, uh, you know, we, we, when, when we do our forecasts and future view studies, we, we tend to do um, three different scenarios, but the most likely scenario is the one that we, we give the, you know, if you subscribe to the study, that's the most likely scenario that you'll get. But you have the option to go in and play with these models and you say, I don't think, uh, you know, for instance, Toyota's, loyalty rate is 80% or something like that. You think it's lower, you think it's higher. How would that affect the overall volumes? Or, you know, it, basically it's a, a neat way for you to play with and, and get involved where we, we always welcome challenges to our, our forecasts. And, and um, our goal is to kind of bring you the, the broader, bigger picture, not necessarily just one singular view. And so, as far as the study goes, there's an executive summary which covers the overall global view of uh, the OEM franchise workshop market and the genuine oils. Um, we do see genuine oils, for instance, growing because there's certainly a lot more OEMs that are uh, getting their own genuine oils. Like VW, for instance, used to be on a co-branded slash merchant branded fluid for many, many years. Um, within the last couple of years, they switched over and not fully yet. You'll still find some uh, merchant branded in their dealerships, but we're seeing a lot more switch over to their VW, Audi, Genuine uh, fluids. And so, you know, you're seeing a lot more OEMs leveraging and going towards their own Genuines. Um, the chapters themselves, uh, as I said, we cover for each of the eight countries. So like the US, India, Germany, uh, France, UK, Indonesia, and China. Um, we cover the franchise workshop channel structure in that country. Um, some of the, the uh, programs for the uh, by OEM in that country as well. Um, and then, you know, we, we provide sort of the channel structure, the segmentation of the dealerships, uh, our, our analysis of, uh, you know, opportunities. So this is kind of what we try to bring with the study. And with that, I'd like to uh, hand it back to Vera. Thank you so much for um, joining us today. Thank you, David. That was very interesting. There was just actually one question uh, during your talk. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to interrupt you, and then you jumped to a different slide. Uh, it was about the sales of um, uh, sales of um, cars, and the question. Let me find it. If you, if we include the EV sales there. Yeah. Okay. No, uh, that was the question. That um, was the question. <laughs> no, uh, the EV sales are not included there. They're certainly becoming more significant, but that was uh, an ICE uh, sales uh, table. Okay, good. Okay, so that, that was the only question that came up. If anybody comes up with uh, another question, you know, you can connect with David. You can see his email right in front of you. You can connect with your account manager, also contacts are there. 
and we'll respond to webinars at clientgroup.com email. We always navigate that question to the correct person. Uh, I thank you for attending. I hope this was helpful. And uh, I hope to see you next week or maybe in our webinars in May and June. So that was, that was great. Thank you, David. And I'd like to say goodbye to everybody.